Isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord? I don't know about you, but we praise together and it's just, it's just wonderful. Let's stand together and let's praise the Lord today. Amen. Amen. It's good to be with God's people. Amen. Let's sing. One, two, three, we go. Let's welcome Omar to the team, huh? You brought me from darkness and clothed me in the garments of praise. And Jesus forever, my song will be you. My name's Daniel. Um, so glad that you're here today. If you are a first-time guest, in all the seats, we've got these welcome cards. And this is just a way that we can get to know you a little bit better. You can get to know us a little bit better. Um, on the back of the card is uh, a, a portion for prayer requests. So if there's anything that you're going through that you'd like a church to join you in praying for, we would love to, 
um, to know about that. If you want to fill this out, you can put it in the offering box on the way out, and we will just join you in praying for God to do whatever you want him to do or what you're asking him to do in your life. And so um, excited about that. Uh, one of the things that we do during this time of the service is really just take a moment and get our hearts right before the Lord and just ask him to speak to us. And so I would encourage you just right now to bow your heads with us and just take a moment and offer up a prayer to the Lord and just say, God, would you speak with me this morning? Would you meet with me today? Father, we come to you this morning with all that we are. We need you. You are the remedy to our life's issues. I pray, Father, that you would turn our, our eyes, our minds, our hearts towards you today. That you would speak to us, that you would uh, move among us and do what only you can do. God, there's some people coming here today, they really need um, to be healed. And there's some people coming today that um, they need encouragement. They need comfort. You know what we need. So we ask that you would, uh, that you would meet us there. And we thank you in advance for what you're going to do this morning. We love you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's stand together and continue to worship. Sing the word together. We say, and I will bless the Lord forever. And I will trust the mat on times. Yeah. He has the
Let's sing this together, church. You're worthy of it all. Lift your voices to Him. You're worthy of it all. the glory. He deserves the glory. How many can say amen this morning? Amen. Amen. We praise you. We praise you because you're worthy. No one else worthy to be praised like you, Lord. Oh, we lift our praise, Lord. something that we do just within these four walls. We live a life of worship to you, Lord. We worship you with our life day and night, night and day. Day and night, night and day, the incense of, the incense of our praise, the incense of our praise, be lifted to your throne. The Lord rejoices in our world.
you're worthy there's no one like you you're the God of heaven and earth and we praise you with all our lives we praise you with all our strength you the surf the best part of us the best the best is to you Lord so we offer you our lives we offer you our attention we offer you Lord our willingness we come willingly before your throne to hear your words and live by them, Lord, because you're worthy. For from you are all things, and to you are all things, you the shift of glory. Amen. Go ahead and take a seat. All right, welcome back from Easter. Wasn't that a great service? We had on Easter, man, it was awesome. Love having a packed house, and I love celebrating the resurrected Christ. And I love that we get to keep doing that every week. Well, today uh, we are starting a new series where we're going to be walking through the book of 1 Peter. And, you know, the whole reason that we uh, walk through books of the Bible um, Sunday after Sunday is because... God chose to communicate to his people through a book. And so the best way to understand a book is to uh, read it from the beginning all the way through. And so we started, uh, you know, uh, months ago in Philippians. We went through Philippians. And then we walked through the book of Judges in the Old Testament. And now we're going to walk through 1 Peter, which is a really cool book. You guys, I I mean, I'm really excited about it because uh, it's packed full of all kinds of great meaning, Um, and it was written by a guy that is just fun to watch in Scripture, because you never know what Peter's going to do. We'll talk a little bit more about about who he is as we get into this, but the thing about it is as we see what God reveals to us in his word, we choose to submit our lives to what he says, and so Week after week, as we go through the book of 1 Peter, I'm not setting the agenda for what we talk about. God's setting the agenda. And so it's just one other way for me personally to go, I'm going to submit myself to your word and to your will, and we're going to talk about whatever you want us to talk about, whatever's next in the Bible. So um, what he's talking about today has everything to do with identity. And uh, it's a really interesting issue in our day today, because uh, if ever we've had an identity crisis as a, as a culture, it's now. I mean, there's all kinds of questions about who are you and how do you discover your identity? You know, um, if you're driving, you probably have your ID card, also known as your driver's license with you. And it tells us a few things about ourselves on that card, right? It tells us what uh, my color of uh, eyes are, whether or not I'm a donor, <laughs> tell, tells you um, my height, my weight, has a photo of me. Is that my identity? I think it's part of it. Definitely not all of it. If you were to look in um, psychology today, they would say that your parents, your peers, and other role models and your past experiences make up your identity. There may be other folks that say, you know, your job your relational status, all plays into this? Well, identity is a big deal because um, 90% of our decision-making is unconscious and automatic. In other words, as you go throughout your life, what you say to other people, what you do, most of it, you don't make a conscious decision to say, hey, I'm going to do this, I'm going to say this. 90% at least. 
is just automatic, and it just comes, it flows out of who we are, our identity. So I'm going to make a statement. Um, I'm curious if you agree with this or not, but here's, here's my statement. Who you believe that you are will determine how you live. Who you believe that you are will determine how you live. And, and throughout Scripture, God is very intentional about telling us who we are. Because he knows how important our identity is. Because the rest of our life's actions are just us playing out who we are, particularly who we believe we are. So as we, uh, as we jump into uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, I want, you to, I want you to start looking for these things. What does this say about our identity? Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now, we were going through Judges. We were covering like a whole chapter at a time. Now, we're just taking two verses. So this will be fun. Starts out with um, the author of the book, Peter. What you got to love about Peter is anytime you see him in Scripture, uh, he is never without passion. In fact, that's one of his trademarks. This guy's got passion whether he's fishing uh, or whether he's fighting or whether he's following Jesus or um, whether he's preaching. Whatever he's doing, he's doing it with all that he is. He's doing it with passion. Even, even when he's running away from Jesus, I mean, he does it with all that he is. And as he's writing this, um, this, this letter... Um, he writes it in the same way. Every single sentence is just packed with meaning all the way. And he's writing to a group of Christians that um, it says have been dispersed. And as you, as you get further in the book, you, you realize he's not, he's not just writing to Jews. He's writing to Gentiles, Jews, anybody who's a follower of Christ all over, uh, all over the known world, particularly in this part of the world. But the letter got passed from uh, one town to another. They would read it in one, and they would, they would take it to another town, and they would read it to another town. So that all the believers were kind of hearing from what this apostle of Jesus Christ had to say. A man who watched Jesus, walked with Jesus, witnessed his death, witnessed his resurrection, his ascension. Man, if there's anyone you want to hear what he has to say, it's a guy like Peter. And what, what is interesting is... Um, He's writing to people who are at a period in their life where they're experiencing a lot of persecution. Um, you know, f- for a while, the Roman uh, government, they didn't take much notice of Christians until they started growing. And so the movement started uh, kind of making an impact. And, you know, when, when my family and I were, when we were missionaries in China, it was the same way. You know, we're, we're, we're living and working, doing illegal activity in a communist nation, which I kind of enjoyed. And, and it's crazy. Uh, we, we had the police show up at our house all the time. One time they literally came to our house, knocked on the door, and we're like, uh-oh. And they're like, can we take pictures with your kids? And like, I don't know if they're posting selfies with our kids or what, but like they literally wanted to get in a photo with our children. <laughs> at the time, it was just our boys. They had blonde hair and blue eyes. And uh, everywhere we went, people wanted to take pictures of us. So, I mean, the police didn't bother us. They liked us. But as soon as um, you start having an impact in China, and I'm sure in Rome, that's when things change. That's when they start taking notice. You know, we, we, we had one point where we, we had a, a group of like 20 college students that came into uh, our town and... I was leading these teams, and I'd separate them into three groups and send them to all these different universities, and they're getting to meet college students, and they're meeting with them afterwards, they're sharing the gospel, and we invited all these college students to come to these Christmas parties where we, where we present the gospel. And we're having lots of kids come to Christ through this thing. Well, then the, then the government got involved. And they start letting these, um, letting these uh, universities know, and then they started saying, you can't come on our university anymore. And I had lots of friends who... Uh, if they started seeing explosive growth in their city, man, the government would come in, they would crack down, they put people in prison, and that's when things got hard. That's what's happening here with these folks. Christianity is starting to spread. It's starting to become known. But on top of that, 
in July, on July 19th, 64 AD, Rome was burned in fire. It was consumed in fire. And it was a devastating fire because the, the streets of Rome were super narrow and you had uh, like two-story houses on both sides of the street that were all made of wood. And as the, as the city burned, people would try to put the fire out and then it would get sparked in other places. And so the people actually st- started be- believing that Nero, who was the emperor, actually started the fires. Nero was, um, I mean, he was pretty insane, but he really loved building. And so um, the people believed that it, he loved building so much that he's going to burn down the city so that he can rebuild it. And they lost everything. They lost, they lost their homes. They lost their family. They didn't have insurance back then to pay for um, fire protection. They lost everything. And so they started getting angry. Three days this thing burned. And they're about to revolt against Nero. And so Nero, he conjures up this lie. And he blames the Christians. It's a little group nobody really knew much about, but was starting to gain recognition. Nobody really liked them because they were not followers of the religion of the day. And he blames, he blames the Christians, and it began a province-wide persecution of Christians that ended up being just, just absolutely horrible. And so Peter's writing Christians in these circumstances. They're, they're, again, being hated and hunted down. And he starts this letter by reminding them who they are. And the first thing that he tells them is he says, you are, number one, not at home. You are not at home. He tells them that they're exiles. Now, that word exile, it's a really, um, it's an interesting word. If you have different translations of the Bible, it's translated differently in a lot of translations. So, you know, the Bible was originally written in Greek, and as we have an English Bible, there's a lot of different people who've translated it. Um, And just like if you were to have a translator here, and someone was speaking in another language, and let's say they were speaking Spanish, and, and Nello's translating it, and then somebody's on the other side translating it also, they would have different translations, right? It's the same way with Scripture. We've got the NIV, we've got the, the New American Standard, we've got the English Standard Version, we've got all these different translations of the Bible. They're all translating the same meaning, just have a little bit of different um, perspectives and goals in the translation. And so when you look at this word, it's translated aliens. You are aliens, It's translated foreigners. You are foreigners. It's translated as strangers. It's translated as sojourners. But my favorite is uh, when it's translated as pilgrims. Pilgrims. I kind of think that one actually has the best um, connotation for us of what, what Peter's getting at here because we get pilgrims. In fact, the whole reason that, that the first folks that came to the States from Europe were called pilgrims They got that from Scripture. But when you think about the pilgrims, they were people who had left England, and first they went to the Netherlands to find religious freedom, and then their kids started picking up a bunch of the culture that they didn't like. They had religious freedom, but they didn't have economic prosperity, and they didn't really feel the freedom to raise their families like they wanted to. So then they they get on the Mayflower. In 1620, they land at Plymouth, and you know the story. They start a colony. In, in the United States, and I mean, it's, it's, it's a part of our history, but, but when you look at some of the reasons that they left, it wasn't just religious freedom, economic prosperity, the ability to raise their kids where they want. Another one that they said was they wanted to bring the gospel to the natives in North America. I like this because that's really what's going on here when Paul says, you are exiles. A lot of the people he's writing to, they had lived in these places their whole life. These are not people who left Rome and went to these places. These are people who, that's actually their hometown. They're from Bithynia. They're from Asia. They're from all these places that he lists. So why does he call them exiles? He calls them exiles because he's he's bringing their attention to the reality that, hey, this place, this city that you're living in right now, it's not your home. You got another home. 
And God is the one who put you there, and he put you there for a purpose. And just like the pilgrims left England and established English colonies in the United States, these believers are bringing a little bit of heaven to earth in the way that they gather, in the way that they love one another, in the way that they love their neighbors, in the way that they impact culture. They're establishing outposts for the gospel, and it's starting to change the cities that they live in. That's what he's saying. That's who you are. This world is not your home. You shouldn't get too comfortable here. That's what he's saying to them, and I think that's what he's saying to us. We need to be change agents, but not like all of our hope is wrapped up in this place. This is not where our hope is. Not in a better government or finding perfect justice here or financial prosperity or retirement or anything else that this world has to offer. That's not where our hope is. Ultimately, Ephesians 2.19, here's what it says. When it comes to heaven, here's what it says. You are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. So that is now where our citizenship is. As God's people, it's not on earth. This is not our home. We're called aliens. (laughs) That's funny. Number two, you are chosen by a loving, sovereign Father. He says, to those who are elect exiles, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Elect exiles. Man, that, that's another one of those words. Lots of meaning. He's, he's, Peter here, he's kind of pulling from the Old Testament. And, you know, the people of God were God's chosen people. To elect something is just to choose something. And God had chosen the Israelites to be his special chosen people. Deuteronomy 7, 7 through 8, it kind of shares with us a little bit about what this is. Here's what it says. God talking about why he chose them. He said, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. So why does the Lord love you? Because he loves you. (laughs) Kind of circular reasoning, but isn't that that the way love works? If you were to ask me, why why do I love my wife? I mean, I could give you all kinds of qualities that I love about her, but ultimately I just love her because I love her. And that's what God is saying. He loves you. He chose you. And there's not a whole lot of um, things we can come up with with why. It's definitely nothing that has to do with us. He just chose to do so. Now that Jesus has been revealed, died for our sins, and we we have salvation in his name, for all who believe in him, the Bible says, you've been chosen. You've been chosen. And, you know, from our perspective, we chose him. We chose to put our faith in him. We chose to follow him, and we still choose to follow him every day. But the Bible makes it clear (laughs) that the only reason that we chose him was because he first chose us. Now, we didn't see that happen. We didn't even know that that happened. This is, this is stuff happening before you were ever born. Here's what it says in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. It says, He chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. Now, that'll blow your mind if you think about it very long. Because did you have to choose Jesus to to, um, become a Christian? Absolutely. Did you have to put your faith in Christ? Absolutely. Did you have a choice in that? Absolutely. And yet, you were chosen before the world was created. That's incredible news. He is, that's what the word sovereign means. He's in control. He's, he's in control of all things, including your salvation and mine. And I know it raises all kinds of questions when you, when you think about that. 
we're not going to go into all the questions, but, but there are two things that you have to hold in tension at all times, and one is that God is in control of all things, and He chose you. And the other is that you are responsible for every choice that you make. I don't know how those two things are um, th- like both real and true, but they are. And I believe it because God's Word says it. It, it is mind-blowing. The whole point of Him saying this, though, is that you recognize that you are really, really loved. That God loves you beyond comprehension. That you are loved so much that I, I love this passage in Ephesians because it, it relates it to adoption. You know, we don't get to choose our family most of the time. I mean, I didn't choose my parents. I didn't choose my children. They didn't choose me. That's just something that we, we, are, we are born into. But it's different with adoption. With adoption, there's a choice and there's a cost. When you adopt someone into your family... You didn't have to do that. You could have adopted somebody else. No, you chose this person to be in your family. And you had to pay a bunch of money to do that. What a beautiful picture of what God has done in us and for us. He adopted us. He elected us because he loved us. That's our identity. We are the loved of God. And, you know, that could get real theoretical. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges um, to understanding the Bible is this is a spiritual book written in physical words, terms, metaphors, analogies, because God is trying to help us understand these giant eternal realities. So I was thinking about how to talk about this, and I was reminded of one of my, my friends and mentors. He was telling a story. He's a grandfather. Now, and um, when his wife and him, when, when, their, when their child had a child, they got to keep this grandbaby for the, one of the first times. And the baby was sleeping in, in its crib, and, and his wife went into the room, and she just stood there just like staring at this baby. And uh, he walks in, and he's like, what are you doing? And she says, I'm just, I'm just waiting for him to wake up. You know, that, that new grandmother, she's just, just, just filled with love. She's like, I just can't wait for this baby to wake up so I can hold him and, and I can, we can play with him. And you know, There's just that sense of overwhelming love for this child. I can't help but think that is how God feels about us. When you woke up this morning, that he, was, he just couldn't wait for you to get up because he's so... Um, excited about having a relationship with you. He went to great lengths to have a relationship with you so that you would be able to commune with him with unbroken fellowship by sin. It's not just something that he did one time and you, you, you just one time put your faith in Christ and now you're said No, no, he wants to walk with you through life. He wants you to experience his love and he wants you to love him back in a real relationship. So I just want you to Close your eyes for a moment. I want you to imagine the God of the universe. And when you woke up this morning, you may not have been thinking about him. He was thinking about you. What does that do to your heart? I'm going to read one passage. Psalm 103, verse 11. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards us who fear him. Incomprehensible. You know, Paul prays in multiple books of the Bible that we would know the height, the width, the depth, the length of the love of God through Christ for us. That should shape our identity. This is a foundational reality 
Maybe the most important thing that, that I'll say this morning, it, it has to do with we are the loved of God. That's who we are as his people. If you live long enough, you've probably heard people tell you messages about who you are. And you've probably had people lie about you. You've probably had people gossip about you. You've probably had people verbally abuse you. And if that happened as you were growing up, it's hard to get rid of some of those messages that you hear. Because you can do something, all of a sudden you're just hearing that person who said that thing about you years ago. And it's just kind of a record that plays in your mind over and over again. And God's wanting to rewire some of that in us and help us to see ourselves like He sees us. He genuinely loves us as His children. Third reality He's getting at is you are being changed. He's writing to the elect exiles according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit. That, that word sanctification, it, it really is a word about change. And when you, when you came to faith in Christ, you didn't have to get cleaned up to do it. You didn't have to, um, you know, get rid of everything that was wrong in your life to come to Jesus. No, he says, just Just come. There, there's a church in town, they, they have a slogan that is, um, no perfect people allowed, come as you are. And that, that was their attempt of communicating this reality that, hey, there's nobody, there's nobody without sin. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And, and it's not because we are without sin that God accepts us in His church. In fact, we are not a church who uh, have no sin. I mean, if you were to look left and look right, everybody in this room, we all have issues. We all have things we would not want displayed on the screen. Every one of us. That's who we are. At this church, um, when there, there came about a time when, when the leadership had to address some sin in the church. And the people who they were addressing didn't like it. And they kind of threw that slogan back in their face and said, hey, you said come as we are. And I love the pastor's response. He goes, yeah. Yeah, God wants you to come as you are, but he don't want you to stay that way. That's what sanctification is. You come as you are, and then the Holy Spirit changes you day by day. My mom used to sing this song to me when I was a kid. Now she sings it to my kids. You may have heard it. <clears throat> He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, uh, the earth and the sun and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be. He's still working on me. I like that message because he created the world and everything we see in like that. But it's our whole life. He's still continuing to patiently grow us and shape us and change us into who he wants us to be and who he's called us to be. And the longer that we walk with Christ, the longer that we walk with Jesus, the more we're supposed to look like him. The more he helps us um, grow. And, and that's really a lot of what loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength is. That there are times with our heart and soul, we've got issues that the Lord addresses. And he might address it through the scriptures. He may address it through another believer. He may address it by his spirit as we pray. And, and it may be attitudes, it may be beliefs, it may be emotions that we've got that, that need some changing, some tweaking, some correcting. They need some cleaning. You know that word sanctify? It really just means to make holy or to holify something. I don't think that's a word, but I, I like it. To holify something, to make it more holy, more pure, more in line with God's nature. And sometimes it's with our heart and soul. Sometimes it's with our mind. There's habits of thought that need to be redirected, changed, gotten rid of. There's worldview that needs to be changed and shaped. There's opinions that need to be changed. And as you walk with Him, as you let His Word clean you, there's a renewing that takes place by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's not overnight. It takes time. 
But it, it starts to change the way you think. And, and then we start having more and more of God's view of things, including God's view of ourselves. And then there's sometimes that we love the Lord with all of our strength, and He shows us with our actions, what, what our actions need to, to change, what words that we speak need to change, our behavior, how it needs to be purified by the Lord. So I just encourage you, when the Lord reveals things to you that need to be changed, you can, you can often feel guilty, and, and you know, it makes us want to kind of sometimes run away from the Lord, but I, I encourage you to run to the Lord when He does that, because it's only for your good. It's because He loves you, that He's helping you see more and more things in your life that need to conform to who He's created you to be and who He wants you to be for your good and for your joy. Ultimately, it's for your joy. The fourth thing that, that this passage tells us that we are is that we are obedient and we are forgiven. <clears throat> you were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood. God's the one who's choosing us to live as aliens in this world, as pilgrims in this world. He's continuing to grow us and sanctify us. But it's for obedience to Him. And did you notice that the whole Trinity is involved in this? Father, Spirit, Son. This is His work, ultimately, that our lives would bear fruit and would look like what He wants, that we would bring more of His kingdom on earth through our lives. This is, this is one of the... Uh, you know, I don't know about you guys, we have a family mission statement. It took me like forever to come up with this family mission statement. But our family mission statement is that we would be a blessing and build up families so that we could see God's kingdom come on earth as it is in, as it is in heaven. And that's, that's what this is. Obedience really looks like loving your neighbor as you love yourself, making disciples. That's what obedience is. It's, it's fruit from our life so that people get blessed because of us. That's ultimately what he's after. That's what he wants to see happen in and through us. And it's exciting. It's so purposeful when God uses you to be a blessing to others. When he uses your family as a change agent. Man, it's just like, I just can't tell you the privilege that I feel when I get to, when I get to help someone grow in their faith. It is so encouraging. But he, this weird phrase, sprinkling with his blood, when I first read this, I thought, what in the world? That is so weird. If you're not a Christian today and you read that, I'm sure you're going, huh? What is this? And it really, it really is First Peter, again, he, he's, he's pulling from the Old Testament, bringing it back into the New Testament. And, you know, in, in the Old Testament, there, was, there were offering and sacrifices for sin. And the sprinkling of blood was always meant to remind people that, that something had to die for you to have forgiveness. Something had to give its life for your payment to be paid. And it was a visual reminder to God's people. And so there's a particular uh, instance in the Old Testament where if someone had leprosy, you know, lep leprosy was, was one of those diseases that was just like a terrible disease to have because everyone was scared of it, and you were cut off from the people of God. You were cut off from God's presence in, his, in, in the temple. You couldn't go to the temple. Anytime anyone got close to you, you had to scream out, unclean, unclean, so that they wouldn't come close to you because they didn't want to catch what you had. But in, in Leviticus chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, when someone had been healed of leprosy, there was a procedure that they had to go through. And they had to go to the, they had to go to the priest and they had to show them that they'd been clean, cleansed and that their skin didn't have this disease anymore. And when they, when they showed the priest that, sure enough, they had been healed, there's a process where the priest would offer a sacrifice and then he would sprinkle this person with the blood of the sacrifice as a sign to everyone and to this person, hey, you, you're clean, you're healed, and now you can, 
you can have fellowship with God's people again, and you can have fellowship with God's presence again. That, that's, what, that's what Peter has in mind here. See, God, God knew that when he saved us, we, our sins would be forgiven. Everything we've ever done, we, we are made clean in that moment. There's a sanctification that takes place over time to where that works out more and more in our life and in our lifestyle. But he knew we were going to continue to sin after the point of salvation. Has anyone ever sinned after you've been a Christian? Anybody? Yeah. And you're lying if you didn't raise your hand. You just sinned. So, so we, we've all sinned, right? And we will sin. And he's saying right here, as you walk through life, I've already made, I've already made a path for forgiveness for you. Every day of your life, there is continual sprinkling of Jesus' blood. In other words, continual forgiveness available to all of us. Isn't that powerful? We don't have to live in guilt and shame. The moment that we mess up, we confess and we return to the Lord. We don't have to have this long extended period of separation. No, no, we just, we just turn back to the Lord because the forgiveness is right there. Covering us every moment of our lives so that we have the freedom to walk in holiness and, and unbroken fellowship with the Lord. Because you know, sin, by definition, separates. Separates us from God, separates us from people. And the quicker that we can confess and turn back to the Lord, the more wholeness we will have in all of our relationships. That's what he's, that's what he's after here, and that's, that's your identity. That's who you are. You are obedient to the Lord as his people, and you are forgiven. 1 John 1, 7 says this, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. In other words, every time you sin, bring it into the light with the Lord, and you're forgiven. Walk with him. He's changing you to be who he's created you to be. This last one here is that you are living in grace and filled with peace. The passage says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. You gotta love that word multiplied. That's a lot different than added. If you were to add um, two plus two 30 times, you'd have 60. But if you were to multiply two by itself 30 times, you would have one trillion. Exponential, man. Love it. That's what he's got in mind here, this, this grace that is unearned favor from the Lord. Nothing you can do to, to, to earn it. You can't achieve it. You just got to receive it from the Lord. That's what, that's what grace is. And Peter's taking an old um, greeting that Jews would often say, peace to you, shalom. And he's, and he's adding, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and peace be multiplied to you. In other words, this is now who you are. This is what Jesus bought for you. This is what you get to live in, grace upon grace, for the rest of your life. Now Jesus... He, when he came, you remember how the scriptures, um, they explained that Jesus was full of grace and truth. Everywhere he went, he was just filled up with grace and truth. And you, you just get the image of uh, somebody walking around with a cup, and it's just full to the brim. Anytime you bump into them, what, what comes out? It's whatever's filled it up. That's what... That's what came. So in Jesus' life, you see people bumping into him, grace and truth, boom, popping out everywhere he went. Just overflowing into the lives of others because he's full of grace and truth. Now, we are full of a lot of things, <laughs> right? And whatever you're full of is what ends up coming out when people bump into you. And, and here, he, he's saying God's will for you is that you be filled with this, grace and peace, so that wherever you go, um, when people bump into you, the words that come out is grace, truth. There's, there's, 
There's a fable that I just um, came across. A little corny, but I thought I'd share it because it, it, it illustrates the point. Um, about an eagle that fell out of its nest. And a farmer found the eagle, and when he saw the eagle, he thought, oh, this looks like a chicken. So he went and put the eagle with the chicken. And the chicken uh, grew up with all these, I'm sorry, the eagle grew up with all these chickens. And so started doing what he saw, pecking the ground and um, scratching the dirt. And he'd look up and see these eagles flying up in the sky and, and uh, say, man, I wish I could fly like that. And the, eagle, and the chickens around him would say, oh, you, you, man, you're just a chicken. That, that'll never be your reality. And so the chicken ends up dying. I mean, sorry, the eagle dies and never got to experience what it meant to be an eagle. So I read that and I thought, eh, partly true. The reality of this is that could be true of us, except God won't let that be true if you're his. Because if you're his, you may have been raised around a bunch of chickens, but he actually, that's why he came. He came to tell you who you are. And, and he's helping you along the way. So if we go back to the fable, man, he, he literally would be the one who came to the eagle and said, hey, no, this is not who you are. Let me show you how to fly. Let me fly with you. Let me train you in this, and I'll walk with you, and I'll give you a community of people to teach you what it means to be an eagle. That's who we are. And the more that we can see ourselves the way that God sees us, the more that we're going to live out this life that he really ha- does intend for us. L- let's pray together about that. Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful that our sin does not define us. Even while this, this culture that we live in tells us that it does. That whatever our desires are, that's who we are. And that if we don't give in to those desires, we're not being true to ourselves. What a lie. I'm so grateful for the truth that sets us free from that. That we don't have to live in that reality. You have created and ex- expressed the ultimate reality. That we are loved by the creator of the universe. That you chose us before the foundations of the world. That you're changing us. That although this world is not our home, you've got a purpose and a plan for us in this world to be agents of change. That we're filled with grace and truth. Lord, thank you. I pray that you would help us to live this out. Help us to, to see like you see so that we can live like you want us to live. And Lord, really, most of all, thank you for loving us. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. Thank you for purchasing our forgiveness with your blood. Lord, our response is um, surrender. May we live lives of worship this week and all of our days. If you're here today and you've never um, put your faith in Christ, you've never chosen to follow him, I want to just tell you, he loves you so much that he came from heaven to earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, and three days later came back to life. And his promise is that if you would trust him, if you would follow him, he'll forgive you of all your sins and help you to live the kind of life that he created you to live. If you would like to do that this morning, I want to give you the opportunity to do that just by um, a prayer. And really the prayer is you calling on the name of the Lord saying, God, would you save me? Would you help me? And so if you've never done that, um, I want to lead you in a prayer right now and just encourage you to, to pray this prayer to the Lord in your heart. Dear God, I recognize that I am a sinner. I've chosen to go my own way and it has led me to places I don't enjoy. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and came back to life three days later. I want to turn away from my sin and I want to follow 
you. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and help me to live like you've created me to live in a restored relationship with a loving Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, if you prayed that prayer, I, I got good news. The Lord does what he says he will do. And he has forgiven you of your sin. And we as a church want to be a part of helping you walk in what that means to have a new life. And so um, two ways you can respond. The first way is um, in the seat, there's a welcome card. There's a, there's a, a, a portion on that card that you can check and say, hey, I just um, believed in Jesus for the first time. I would ask you to put that in the offering box on your way out so that we can get in contact with you and help you know what it means to follow Jesus. But also, um, I'll be up here in the front with my wife. We'll be up here. If, if you would like to talk with us, um, we'd love to talk with you. Or if you need prayer for anything, we'll be in the front. We'd love to pray with you. This is our time to respond to the Lord. And so as we think about doing the word this week, put it into practice, I wonder how um, your view of yourself lines up with what God has said. And if there's any areas that aren't lined up, what needs to change? As we worship in this last song, I just encourage you to ask that question of the Lord and let him speak to you. So let's stand together. We'll sing one last song.
you, but I'm excited about going through First Peter together, and uh, just an encouragement. Uh, if you read back through Peter in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then you read about Peter in Acts as Jesus has entrusted him to help lead the church, and you see the transformation in his life, it's just really neat, and it's encouraging to know that even when we blow it, as we see Peter do lots of times, that the Lord uses us, and so I'm excited about going through First Peter. I wanted to share a few announcements real quick before we dismiss this morning. First off, I want to remind you, uh, we have our new members class coming up on April the 21st and April the 28th. It's kind of a two-part class on Sundays right after the morning worship service. And so uh, this is kind of our, our process. If you're interested in becoming a member of the Hill Church, uh, this is one of those steps in the process. And so uh, you'll be a part of this meeting. We'll talk, uh, Daniel and I will talk a lot about uh, the Hill Church and where God's leading us and just who we are and how you can be a part of that. And so we encourage you to attend that. But also what I just want to say, if you're already a member and you want to be a part of the class, we'd love for you to be a part too. Um, and so you can be a part of that and get to experience, uh, meet new people and, and all of that great stuff. And so on the table in the back here uh, with the Hill Church tablecloth, uh, there is a sign-up sheet if you're interested in being a part of that. Again, it's April the 21st and April the 28th, right after the morning worship service. It's usually about an hour and a half or so uh, afterwards, and then uh, we, we dismiss. And so I encourage you to sign up to be a part of that. I also mentioned our family mission trip in the summer to the Rio Grande Valley. And so uh, last year we took a team of family and down to the valley and got to participate in some awesome ministry down there. And so uh, we're excited to go back down there again. And so uh, I will have a sign up for uh, you at the back. Um, and uh, sorry, I will have a sign up. I will send out this week uh, for the family mission trip um, that you can sign up and be a part of that. And uh, we partner with uh, some churches down there to do VBS. We uh, partner with a ministry down there to lead worship and, and share the gospel with minors who are seeking asylum. Uh, we're also looking in some other opportunities to minister to some families who are um, here from other countries, and we get the opportunity to get to share the gospel and love them in the way that Jesus would love them. And so it's a great, great experience, awesome time, great tacos, um, great food. Um, but, uh, but it's also a really, really awesome opportunity for your family to get to serve together. And so I want to encourage you. Uh, I'll send some more information out about that this week, but I want to let you know about that. Uh, we also, if you're interested in mowing, uh, we've got a sign up in the back there too. Mr. Don uh, has a sheet there. And so if you're interested in, in mowing, we've got equipment here. Um, so if you're like, I love cutting grass, it is like therapeutic for you, um, then hey, we've got a job for you. We'd love uh, for you to help out with that. And uh, it's a great way to just kind of enjoy uh, the weather. It's, it's great. And then lastly, student ministry tonight, 530 to 730. Invite all 6th to 12th graders to come back tonight in this room. Uh, we'll have a fun time together and, and study the Word together. Uh, but then also, uh, if, if you're a parent of a teenager and you want to know more about camp, you have questions about camp, uh, we're going to have a quick, brief meeting at 5.30 as well tonight to kind of just answer any questions, talk a little bit more details about camp as the deadline for that is, is coming soon. And so just want to make that mention as well for parents of teens. With that, um, let me pray for us, and then we'll be dismissed this morning. Let's pray. God, we come to you this morning. We're so thankful for who you are. God, that we have an identity in you. And God, I pray for forgiveness as we, sometimes in our lives, Lord, we forget who we are. 
who you've called us to be. God, that we try to live out an identity that is not what you want us to be. God, I pray that you'd help us to, to see you each and every day, to wake up, to see that, that you're waiting to spend time with us. And God, that we would take the time to spend with you. God, we, we continue to celebrate your death and resurrection. God, and what that means and the gospel message that we have hope and salvation in Jesus Christ. God, again, we, we thank you. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Y'all have a great week. Enjoy the clips. Eclipse.